Here we go, Cubbies. Here we go. Here we go, Cubbies. Here we go. Here we go, Cubbies. Here we go. Okay, guys, Timmy coming at you here. Today, um, we're going to go over some of the major parts of the brain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the lower parts of the brain and their function. And then I'll move up to the cerebral cortex. All right. So here we go. Um, again, the spinal cord really basically is like a highway. All it really does is transmits electrical impulses like sensory input, touch, pain, hot, cold from the tissues of your body towards the brain. The motor portion of the brain goes from the brain down to innervate the body. So. The spinal cord only processes reflexes. It's basically a way of transmitting sensory and motor neural information to the brain and spinal cord. So let's start with the medulla. First of all, as we learned when we talked about the respiratory system, the medulla oblongata is intimately involved in regulating breathing. Also, as you know, there's uh, chemoreceptors in the medulla, and those chemoreceptors recept chem. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, hydrogen ions for breathing. Remember CO2 plus H2O, carbonic acid, lest we forget. So the medulla also is involved in heart rate and um, blood pressure control. So it can increase or decrease your heart rate depending on which nervous system is stimulated. So it adds both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. The medulla also has what's the vasomotor center. So vas, vessel, motor, movement. So it can cause arteries to constrict or it can cause arteries to dilate. The medulla is also involved in reflexes like um, vomiting swallowing and sneezing. Here's the other thing. Um, that's why, um, because it has um, innervation um, to the back of the throat, the medulla, uh, when you gag, that causes you to want to vomit. So anytime you stimulate the uvula, a little punching bag in the back of your throat, or you stimulate the back of your throat, that will initiate the gag reflex and then potential vomiting. Also, Drugs can uh, stimulate the medulla, and the result is vomiting. That's why one of the most common side effects associated with medications are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So that goes without saying. So that there is the medulla. Okay, so now we're going to move up a little bit. We're going to talk about the pons. The pons is directly above the medulla. A couple of things about the pons. Number one, it's involved in breathing as well. It's 
specifically it prevents you from taking too big a breath. So it kind of regulates the transition between breathing in and breathing out. Number two. The pons is like a relay station. For uh, sensory input. Hearing. Equilibrium balance. The other thing that the pons is involved in is the sleep wake cycle. There's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system that tells you to wake up or go to bed. So the pineal gland located in this area secretes a hormone called melatonin. And melatonin is secreted when it's dark out. So when you close your eyes and fall asleep, the pineal gland releases melatonin and that activates the reticular activating system and tells you to go night night. Then, when the sun comes up, your eyes, even though they're closed, will sense that and melatonin will stop being released and the result is that you wake up. So that's why people take melatonin for jet lag or as a sleep aid. The other thing that the ponds, and specifically the reticular activating system. It's a part of your brain that will um, partially paralyze you while you're sleeping. So it kind of partially paralyzes your skeletal muscles because when you're dreaming, if that didn't happen, you would act out your dreams. That's sleepwalking. So people with sleepwalking, there's a disconnect there. It's also involved in that um, sleep paralysis. I don't know if you guys ever experienced that, where you wake up and you can't move for a few seconds. That's involved in that. And that can be just a normal variant for most people. It can be a sign that there's something wrong with your brain. Okay, now we come to the thalamus. The thalamus is actually kind of interesting. The thalamus, located right here, because it says thalamus. Mm -hmm. um, it is the primary. sensory relay station. So it takes sensory input from literally every organ of your body except smell and it processes it and then determines what becomes conscious to you. So it's kind of like a bouncer at a bar, right? Only lets certain people in or, well, in the club. So that's his primary function. Let me give you an example. For example, you can be in a room of 500 people. 
and if you hear your name, you're immediately going to attend to that because that's important to you. Another thing is, is that when you're driving in your car, you always notice the same make and model that you're driving because you'll look at it and say, geez, that person must be cool too. Ain't that right? The other thing that the thalamus does is it's involved in, along with the reticular activating system, in uh, waking up. So if you damage the thalamus, that can result in a, a permanent coma. So you don't want that. So that is the thalamus. All right, then let's look at our buddy, our pal, the um, hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, oddly enough, is below the thalamus. And connected to the thalamus is this little gland called the pituitary gland. And as we know, the hypothalamus is involved in um, hunger, maintaining body temperature, and thirst. So those are the primary functions of the hypothalamus, and those are basic biological functions. So remember that the nervous system acts quickly, but it affects its effects go away quickly. So the hypothalamus, in combination with the pituitary gland, which is glandular, so it releases hormones, these hormones can augment the effects of the nervous system. So it can make the effects greater and they can last longer. So that's why the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are connected. Okay, and then the corpus callosum. This is this big, thick band of neural tissue that separates the two hemispheres of the brain. It allows the right and left hemisphere of the brain, which do different things, to communicate with one another. And these, all these fibers are myelinated, so the electrical impulses that travel through the corpus callosum from one hemisphere to the other um, need to travel very, very fast, and myelinated fibers allow that. So. One of the problems with um, people who develop um, epilepsy, severe seizure disorder, is that controlling neural information between the right and left side of the brain. Um, how I like to explain it is for most people, there's like a little traffic cop who's anorexic, right? And with people with epilepsy, the traffic cop is gone. He took a day off. The result is is this massive exchange of neural uh, information between the two hemispheres of the brain. And the result is in a seizure. So people will seize due to that massive brain activity. That's why one of the drugs that they give for people who are in seizures are, is valuable. And what Valium does is basically slows things down, slows that neural information down to relieve the seizure. In people who have epilepsy, basically they take drugs, Keppra, Dilantin, Phenobarbital, uh, Tegretol. All of those drugs decrease neural activity. And by decreasing neural activity, you can prevent the seizure. But in kids, it can be bad because it can um, suppress brain development. So some of these kids have learning disorders, learning disabilities because of being on seizure medicine for so long. The other thing is because it slows brain activity down, it causes sleepiness. So some of these people are taking so much of that drug to try to con control the seizure they end up sleeping their life away for the most part. So in people who are refractory, nice, meaning medications that they're using to treat the epilepsy simply isn't working. What they'll do is they'll go in and they will sever 
the corpus callosum. So they can't communicate with one another. The problem is, is that, you know, for most people, you wouldn't even know it unless you tested it, where you tested one side of the brain versus the other. And if you do do that, the result is they will have problems forming words depending on the side of the brain with the testing or <clears throat> they can't identify it. So they'll look at something like an apple. They're like, I know what that is. I just can't form the word for it. So that's the corp. Okay, so now let's get to the cerebral cortex, the outer part of the brain. And this is where you get into some more of the specialized functions of the brain. First of all, we have um, the occipital lobe. And the occipital lobe is involved in vision. Basically what it does is it takes neural input generated by the rods and cones in your retina. It then travels through the optic nerves. It meets at the optic chiasm, that little splitting inside the brain, right below the pituitary gland. And then the occipital lobe will interpret that into visual stimuli. So if there is damage to the occipital lobe, it can result in blindness. People who have seizures, um, watching TV or watching a movie or going to a disco, the flashing lights can stimulate um, a seizure. It's a photosensitive epilepsy and it's called flicker stimulation. So when lights flicker, that can stimulate a seizure in some people. Then we have the um, temporal lobe, the side. It's a big function. The temporal lobe is involved in hearing. So it will take neural input from um, the cochlea and it will interpret it into sound. So the primary uh, auditory cortex is in the um, temporal lobe. Also, <coughs> the temporal lobe interprets what you see. So you form pictures in the occipital lobe, but in the temporal lobe you um, interpret what you see. So damage to the temporal lobe can result in hearing loss and the inability to interpret what you're seeing. Also, this is important, the temporal lobe is involved in forming long-term memory. Okay, then we have the um, parietal lobe. The parietal lobe, located right here, the parietal lobe is involved in interpreting um, the sense of touch. It's also involved in like two point discrimination and the ability to say, you know, um, on the palm of your hand, you write the letter L. Because of the parietal lobe and its ability to interpret that, you know that that is the letter L. It's called a graphesthesia, the ability to know when someone's writing on your skin what they're writing. Um, <clears throat> I would, um, you know, if I wrote on a student's skin, they'd have clothes on, of course. I would write, read the textbook, which the parietal lobe would not be able to interpret. Even on videos, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, uh, the parietal lobe is involved in um, um, visual and spatial relationships. So the ability to 
distinguish distance and how close or how, how far away objects are from one another. That's its primary function. And then, you get it. That's good for the one and only cerebellum. The cerebellum actually looks like it's a separate part of the brain. Cerebellum actually in Latin means little brain. Um, but it's actually densely packed myelinated fibers and the cerebellum's primary function is in refining refining its movement. So it allows you to move fluidly. The primary motor cortex located in the parietal lobe, it will initiate movement, but that movement will be very herky-jerky, and it is refined and then sent out to the body through the cerebellum. So thus, if the cerebellum is damaged, it will result in herky-jerky movements and kind of a shuffling of the gait. So you kind of figure out where I'm going with this one. So here in the um, parietal lobe, you have the uh, primary motor cortex that initiates movement. Then through a neurotransmitter released by the basal ganglia of the brain, located in the middle portion of the brain, it releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine, along with other neurotransmitters, then signal the cerebellum to refine those movements. So if your substantia nigra is damaged and you lack the ability to secrete dopamine, produce it and secrete it, then the primary motor cortex is a hard time communicating with the cerebellum. The result is that shuffle gait, the shakiness, all those things associated with Parkinson's.